Welcome, everyone. Happy Monday. It's Michael Gibbs, and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Careers. And we're here today to answer any questions you have about your cloud computing career. Maybe a desire to be a solution architect. Maybe your goal is to be a cloud architect. Maybe you want to be a cloud engineer, or maybe you want to be an enterprise architect. In any case, we want to help you build the cloud computing career of your dreams. My name is Mike Gibbs, as I mentioned, but many of you know that I've been working in tech now for over 25 years. No, seriously, it's a long time. And I've been helping others get their first tech job or get promoted in tech. And I've been coaching people through their careers for more than two decades. And I want to help you get cloud hired or cloud promoted. So bring us your questions so we can help you build the best career. I've been a career coach for a long time. And I was lucky enough to have a great tech career coach. And let me tell you, what I learned from my coach saved me decades to get to the level that I wanted to be. And that's why we're here. Because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And if you know the job exactly, exactly, you can get there. So kind of keep these things there. So make sure that's why we're here. So let's talk about some free things we have to help you. We have a webinar this week on Thursday, and it's going to be about how to get your first cloud architect job. It'll be a fun webinar. We'll tell you everything you need to know to make sure you don't think an architect is a DevOps engineer, for example, or you don't think it's a cloud engineer, because I've got to tell you, every day we see people trying to learn these things, and they're never hired. We fix them, we train them, and tell them exactly what to learn, and poof, they're hired. Every day, almost every day, one of my students gets hired. So there's that. So join us on Thursday for the free How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. My team has extended the 35% off sale for a little bit longer. How much longer is that sale on, Chris? Uh, through today, I believe. Through today. So if you want to get cloud hired, you have until, I'd say, midnight today to be able to take advantage of that uh, 35% off sale. So take advantage of it if you're looking to get your first cloud architect job. Now, our team is going to be releasing a free Google Professional Cloud Architect book coming very soon. And if you'd like to get a copy of that free book, sign up for the pre-release, and uh, we'll email it to you as soon as it's ready. And i got to tell you that uh, we will be posting so much more content on LinkedIn. I mean, I've got blog articles, magazine articles stacked up and ready to go. We got a, a dozen videos that are waiting to be queued up and sent out. So please follow us on LinkedIn so you can be informed of all the great things that we do. While you're at it, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit that bell so you get notified of everything we do. And if you're not, um, it didn't hit the bell yet, hit the bell anyway, and then you'll be notified. So webinar this week, 35% off sale until the end of the day. Free Google book and follow us on LinkedIn. Now, at this point, bring in the question so I can help you build your absolute best cloud computing career. And while we're at it, tell us where you're from and tell us what kind of job you want. Give us a hashtag for a solution architect. Give us a hashtag for a cloud engineer and tell us your geography. I'm in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Nice and warm here today, about 95 degrees, super sunny outside. And my cat and I were doing yoga outside and we loved it. So bring us your questions so we can help. Eddie, Patrick, welcome everyone. Yes, let's get everybody caught hired. Pradeep, hi Pradeep, how are you today? Collins, cloud hired over there on Twitch. I'm loving that. Pradeep, how can you speak to someone real over the phone? You joined our demo class two months back and wasn't sure if it was right for me. Now you would like to take that serious. Well, Pradeep, I wish you took our class two months ago because you'd be two months closer to working as a cloud architect. And many people think that they can just do certifications and get a cloud architect job. And unfortunately, that won't work for anybody. So if we would have started two months ago, the average cloud architect earns $12,000 a month. You'd be about $2,400 ahead. But in any case, we'd be happy to help you. So there's two ways you can ask questions. If you want to ask questions, I'm here right now. And you can personally ask me questions. And you can ask me questions on that webinar on Thursday. So there's that. And if you want to ask, speak to me, you can ask your questions here or now. Now, my team also did provide you the phone number. You are more than welcome to call and speak to somebody from my team. Or I'm here right now. 
If you want the guidance from me, ask your questions and I'll do what I can to answer them. And that way you'll get to hear them from me. But in any case, I've got a great team that would be happy to speak to you. And the key is, the sooner you get registered, the sooner you will be hired. We know what it takes to get people hired. We've gotten people hired in pretty much every country you can think of in the past year. Australia, New Zealand, India, England, Canada, US, South America. Every single day we've got somebody that's getting hired. Middle East, oh, you name it, all over Europe. So the point is, we want to help you too. So please feel free to ask us your questions while I'm here. Or you can call the number that Chris from my team gave you and you can speak to Chris or Alonzo or Leo or some one of the wonderful people on my team. So uh, Chris, we can bring in the next question. That's the point. Why does everyone seem to think architects, engineers, and DevOps are one of the same things? Nobody thinks that, that that's the point. So here's what's going on. You have people that have an engineering background that push engineering into architects. And hiring managers don't want engineers as architects. I spoke to one just last week. I spoke to the chief technology officer and the chief engineering officer, the chief information officer of a company. And he says, Mike, I lost a chance to hire one of your architects. I offered him a position and he went elsewhere. Can you send us more? And they said, Mike, I don't want DevOps engineers. I don't want cloud engineers. I don't want software engineers. I don't want techies. I want a business executive that can talk to the customer, ask about their business goals, their business pain points, and business challenges. I then need someone that can craft those technical requirements and hand it to a build team of engineers to build it. So our customers tell us this. Now, that's the point. If you go to AWS, where our students work, if you go to Microsoft, where our students work, if you go to IBM, where some of our students work, Red Hat, where some of our students work, JP Morgan Chase, where our students work, Deloitte, where our students work, Accenture, where our students work, Capgemini, where our students work. And I can go on with a lot of really incredible companies where our graduates work. None of them ever touch the technology, ever. So what you see is you'll see certification providers that have never been architects. And here's how you can tell. An architect is a business executive that got some executive presence. And you see one certification provider that hides behind PowerPoint spreadsheets and makes up funny names for his cats. I love cats too, but there's that. You got another person that hides in a little corner and architects don't do that. So what's going on is you're seeing engineers try to tell you how to be an architect. And that's why nobody gets hired. That's why I had to create this program. That's the point. It is extremely clear, extremely clear. Now, I know there's some nonsense job descriptions, and here's why. You have to understand the role of HR. Now, what hiring managers want and what HR wants is two separate things. What hiring managers want is somebody that's competent and can actually do the job. That means architectural design. That's energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate about the work. Hiring managers want someone that knows what they know and knows what they don't know. And hiring managers want someone that's willing to go above and beyond and a team player. You got the architect of the arc, the archetype of the architect is a business executive with soft skills, leadership skills, executive presence, emotional intelligence. That's the point. I had a director from AWS come on my team call and say, I love this program because you're not making DevOps engineers. He said, you have no idea. Everybody gets a SysOps certification, a DevOps certification, and they want to be an architect. I can't hire them. They don't know architecture. So you need to understand that there's 5,000 applications on general for the average job. And HR has zero idea to determine what you need or don't need. So HR puts down roadblocks on the resume to keep you from applying because they don't want five, five or 50,000 applications. So they say 10 Olympic gold medals, a career in this, a career in this, and a career in this. And then they send them up to the hiring manager and we interview them and we laugh hysterically and we escort them out of the office inside of five minutes. Sorry, can't hire you. Come back when you have more experience. And come back from when you have more experience means the person's bad and we can't hire them. Now, HR doesn't want you to apply and HR believes that if you've done something for 30 years, you must be good at it, right? That's the ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. You could do something great for 30 years and be really incredible. Or you could do something wrong every day for 30 years and get worse by the day. Competency and experience are two opposite ends of the spectrum. Sometimes they're related and sometimes they're not. Now, it's not just me. 
what happened is people looked at these dumb job descriptions. I'm going to tell you right now, they're dumb job descriptions. And they literally speak and have absolutely nothing that we actually do in any way, shape, or form. Let me see if I can actually... Uh, I'll, and I'll actually, they, the, the hiring manager actually gave us a list of exactly what we want in a cloud architect, and there's no engineering on it. In fact, here's what happened. Gartner started asking chief information officers, what do you want in a cloud architect? And the reason Gartner started asking is the silly job descriptions with DevOps and non-tech and non-architect work. Now, the role is a design role, present role, and sell role. We'll never touch the technology. There's no engineering in our world. So published in CIO magazine, and this is the executives who hire you saying, this is what I want. This is the best list you're ever going to find. Don't listen to me, even though I've been an architect for, for 25 years. Don't listen to my 100 plus people that got hired in the last year that never touched the technology. Listen to CIO magazine. The CIO sets the tech strategy for the organization. They are your boss. They determine what you get paid, how many people they hire, how many people get fired in the tech division. And when they asked the chief information officer, what do you want? They said, we'd like someone that could lead the cultural change for cloud adoption. Someone that can develop and coordinate a cloud architecture and someone that can develop a cloud strategy and coordinate the adoption process. And then what do you want them to do every single day? They said, find talent with the necessary skills, assess application software and hardware, creating a cloud broker team, establishing best practices for cloud across the company, selecting cloud providers and vetting third-party services, overseeing governance and mitigating risk, working with the IT security people to monitor privacy and develop incident response procedures, manage budgets and estimate cost and operate at scale. What did you not hear? I can tell you one thing. You heard no engineering, no DevOps, and you never will because it's somebody else's job. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. In our experience, when we see people with DevOps certifications and SysOps certifications and all this engineering stuff, they go on interview after interview and they get hammered on tech stuff. When we remove that stuff, not only does the person get hired, they get hired and paid far more because that's the point. Nobody wants a techie as an architect. Nobody. They don't want an engineer. They want an executive. In fact, that's the point. I know companies that will never hire engineers to be architects for that reason or sales reps from that reason. And I think it's terrible. They should be hiring engineers because they've got a foundation. But the point is, they want somebody that's such an executive, they don't want any engineering in them. So no, it's completely different. Everybody that actually does the hiring knows this. Anybody that's been hired knows this. And everybody that's actually working knows this. Who doesn't know this? Certification providers that have never worked in their life in this. They've been stuck at some academy for the last 10 years. And they make some silly pictures and hide behind the pictures. And you can't even see them because they won't even be on camera. Those people have nothing, nothing, nothing related to this. Now, it's sad because these job descriptions were so stupid. Now, I want to tell you that's the point how you create a job description. I'm going to tell you how I create them. I work for a company and they say, Mike, I need a job description. And I look at that. I'm like, I'm not writing a job description. And then HR says, Mike, I need a job description. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Dice, Zip Recruiter. Indeed, monster.com, and I'm going to pull some silly job description. And it's going to be like eight pages long. And then what I'm going to say is none of this is what I need. So I'm going to put a little BGP, a little architecture, a little CXO relevancy. Now you got my job description, which is cut and pasted from somebody else. And I've seen people cut and paste my job descriptions too. Just like there's some certification providers that not copy my words every day. Of course, they don't understand what's behind it. That you'll see this also on job descriptions, where you'll get one job description and another job description. I've literally seen job descriptions that are right, written straight out of the CIO magazine article. I've seen ones that are coming out of engineers. So the point is, is what I would do is cut and paste into it, paste it on the internet, and somebody would cut and paste mine. I don't worry about job descriptions, that's the point. In fact, I've never had more than 10% of the things on the job description. And I've never gone in an interview and not gotten hired, gotten an offer. So the key is to be exactly what the hiring manager wants and not even look at this. Now, that's the point. You know, I have some really good recruiters. I mean, some extremely good recruiters that have gotten so many of my students hired. And I asked them, I said, when you see one of these job descriptions that's all non-architecture, what do you do? She says, the first thing I do is call the manager because I know HR wrote it, and that's not what the manager wants. I know what an architect is. And so there's that. So keep that in the back of your mind. Don't worry what's in a job description. 
worry about your ability to design, present, and sell, because that's what we do. We don't ever touch the technology. Great question there. That's the point. Let's go to the next one. And please feel free to ask us your questions. SS, you're a telecom as a solution architect. And what do you need to move into a cloud architect role? Well, SS, I don't know what you mean by solution architect because a solution architect could be anything. A solution architect can be an engineer. There usually isn't. A solution architect could be somebody that works at a Home Depot and sells carpet. I've seen solution architects working in food restaurants. So a solution architect really means just you're designing somebody's solution. So I don't know what solutions you're offering. Now, I don't know whether the solutions you're offering are MPLS-based WANs. I don't know whether the solutions you're offering are some managed anything. So I don't have enough information based upon your background to tell you what you need. But I'm going to tell you this right now. You said something basically DP, DPI. I don't know what DPI is. Could you translate it into actual English and words? You know, people say, Mike, I'm interested in VMs. And I said voicemail, voice message, vulnerability management, virtual machine. So, okay, so, okay, you're doing deep packet inspection, which basically means you're working on a box. So that's not really a solution architect in the current, in the world that we would see it. So that's more of an engineering where you're looking at deep packet inspection of something going on a single box or a firewall. So how do you take that and translate that into a cloud architect? The first thing that you have to know is when we're dealing with a cloud architect, we're dealing with the following technology. Now, SS, I'm going to make this clear. Most of what you need to learn is not tech to be a cloud architect. I'm going to say this again. Most of what you need to learn is not tech. But let's talk about the tech first. So what you would need to know tech-wise is going to be this, these things from the networking, which is going to be BGP, some interior gateway protocol knowledge, such as OSPF or intermediate system to intermediate system, IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route aggregation. You're going to have to know this and know this in depth. Switching and switching protocols. For example, VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree. Now you're also going to need to know WAN technologies, which would include, and you probably know some of these, uh, IPsec tunnels, SSL-based VPNs, private lines, Ethernet over MPLS, software-defined networking, and SaaS. Now, you need to have a good understanding of NAT and not just like the one-to-many NAT like you'd see on a firewall, one-to-one -one NAT, static NAT, dynamic NAT, port address, translation, and all the use cases that you would use them. Relatively strong knowledge of ARP, proxy ARP, DNS, DHCP, those sort of protocols. Now, on the data center side, you're going to have to have a strong understanding of virtualization and containers and uh, container orchestration, um, block storage, object storage, file storage, databases, no SQL databases, relational databases, good knowledge of ERP applications, unified communications applications, uh, customer relationship management applications, and many other business applications that exist in the supply chain, et cetera. And you also need to understand, you know, load, load balancers, network load balancers, application load balancers, how to stack them and improve them and tune them. On top of that, what you actually need to learn is as follows. <coughs> Next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, VPN concentrators, zero trust, as well as authentication systems. Now, that's the 50% of what you need to know. And we cover all this in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Now, the next thing that I would suggest is as follows. You also need to do this. Now, you will never get hired for one of these jobs unless you do this. You must focus on your communication skills. And you need to make be an executive and be used to speaking to CEOs because you're going to be doing constantly. CEOs, CTOs, CFOs, CIOs, huge part of our job, critical, critical, critical component that we need to address and we need to get into it. That means you're going to need to be CXO relevant. Now, when you speak, you can't just say this next generation firewall does deep packet inspection, which can protect your system. You need to say, we've got a next generation firewall. And it's different than traditional firewalls because it's adaptive in nature. It can see what's going on. It can see a threat and it can adapt to it in real time. 
So that's the executive presence or the gravitas piece that you need to get. Now, because you'll be selling things upwards of a billion dollars, you're going to have to have extremely good sales skills to be an architect. Remember, architects are not engineers. Now, you'll be presenting in front of audiences of 5,000 plus people as an architect, so you're going to need some excellent presentation skill training, which we teach as well. You're going to have to be managing and leading you know, 50 people at a time to do proof of concept, so you're going to have to have some good leadership skills. Now you'll be presenting at conferences, writing thought leader doc documentations, being published in magazines, newspapers, like I am constantly. It's part of the job. So that's going to give you another level of communication skill. You're then going to have to know how to do things like read a balance sheet, read a financial statement, perform, build a business case, and show the customer the value of the solution you pro proposed is greater than its cost. And then lastly, you're going to need to be able to uh, convince your management to give you peace, resources, and people. So those are the things that you need to know. No, these are mostly non-technical things. Training as an engineer will not make you an architect. You need to train to be an architect. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. It's 50 to 60% business, 40 plus percent tech. So do that, and you'll have a great job, SS. I mean, it's a truly great job. I absolutely love it. I've been working in this forever. And kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Hey, Mike, Chris, and Alonzo. I passed my AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate exam on Friday. I want to thank you guys for everything you do. Congratulations. I'm so happy for you. That's the first step in building your cloud career. This is excellent, excellent, excellent news. Hope you took advantage of lots of our free training, our free ebooks to get this. And I am so excited and happy to hear this from you today. So congratulations. This is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful news. I'm super excited and so happy to hear it. Let's everybody give a congratulations for Philo Koti. It's kind of a cool name. I may have mispronounced it, but I absolutely love, love it. Philo in Greek means love. So it's pretty, pretty terrific. So kind of keep that in the back of your spirit. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So, Chris, bring me in the next one. But good news. I always like good news. I says, in fact, you have an interview with AWS. What should you pair for from a technical perspective topics? I gave you the topics. But really, the key here as SS is you got to not look like an engineer. You have to be an executive. So make sure you've got a nice suit, like an Armani suit or a Canali suit. If you don't have one, buy one. Because you're going to need that for these kind of roles. There's a reason these principal roles can be $300,000 a year roles because they've got executive communication in there the whole way. So get yourself a good suit. Now, when you do this, you're going to have to present to them in one of these things. You're going to have to present like an executive. Now, engineers like to talk about problem, 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 problem. And then here's the fix. Architects talk about the fix and then the substantiating evidence. So make sure you get that presentation. Now, when you speak to AWS, and we get people hired by AWS every single day, it's constantly our students are getting by AWS, not every day, but all the time, then, you know, they are really looking for someone with soft skills. There's also some leadership principles that they have, which we made a video on our YouTube channel. You need to inject those leadership principles in there, and you need to really prepare well for the behavioral kind of questions, like tell me about a problem you had with a person and what you did about it. Because AWS is big, big, big on this. But it's not that what you prepare from a technical perspective. It's what you prepare from a business executive perspective. That's really the key. Business, business, business. An engineer focuses on technology. An architect focuses on business. I'm going to say this again because this is really critical. If you've been an engineer for a long time, you are handicapped on an architect interview. And here's the reason. The engineer is focused on the tech. And when I left engineering and became an architect, I almost got fired because I touched the tech. And when I touched the tech, I lost sight of the big picture. It's about 25 years ago when I switched from engineering to architecture, I actually got fired, almost got fired because I want you to focus on the business, business, business. What's the business value of the thing you propose? How does it assist the business? What's the return on capital? How fast is the payback period? Is it better to be an operational expense versus a capital expense? 
What is the organization's weighted average cost of capital to balance that out to determine is it cheaper to buy like in the data center versus rent? What are the business requirements? How do you build the availability systems that you need? What kind of disaster recovery works? What kind of multi-cloud works in most cases? So these are the kind of things that you should pair for. What is the business? Now, you know, when I have people that come from an engineering background, a technical background where they're looking at one component, they want to focus on the tech. Just like you said, technical perspective. It's not a technical thing. It's a business thing. So make sure you know all those networking and data center things that I talked to you about before. But mostly, focus on the business. How does this next generation firewall help them? I'm in the cloud. Now that I'm in the cloud, if I need a next generation firewall, what do I do? What kind of load balancers need to be there? So you don't prepare topics. You prepare architectures. And engineering is about this box. The architecture is about the big picture. So because you come from a technical background, the whole time where you're going to get techie, 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 you got to step back and big picture. So that's the real secret to these architect interviews. Business, business, business. And that's why, you know, how critical are these skills, SS? It cost me about a quarter of a million dollars to learn these business and soft skills. I'm not joking. Now, it paid for itself in about a year. It cost me and my company sponsors about a quarter of a million dollars to learn these soft skills, communication skills, executive presence, CXO relevancy. Now, I teach all of those skills in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. And the reason I teach these skills in the Cloud Architect Career Development Program is twofold. I know that it's impossible to get these good jobs without it. I also know that the difference between good sales skills and business acumen is an easy one to $200,000 in your pay once you get $200,000 of two years of experience. And that you got an architect that's a techie and they earn 130. And you got an architect that's got business executive experience and they earn three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year. So focus on that. And to be a principal architect at AWS is going to be much more about your business than your tech. Business, 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 business. So focus on these businessy things, either with us. You can also, to build your career, get these businessy things in an MBA program. Look, we took about an incredibly expensive leadership training course and soft skills course and presentation skills course and business acumen course and stuck it inside of our Cloud Architect Career Development Program for the following reason. I know most people can't afford that quarter of a million dollars to get the kind of education that I have. And I want everybody to get it at a price that's one to two days pay for the average graduate in our program. So. Go do this. It is a great company, AWS. They hire lots of our people. And we've got a lot of students that are very, very happy there. But nope, when you talk to the architect there, there's no coding test. There's no configuration test. It's design, present, and sell. So say it with me, SS. The architect role is one of design, present, and sell. And you'll be great, great, great. Let us know how you did after the interview. While we're at it, if you guys can give me a hashtag cloud architect in the chat box and bring in me some more questions so I can help you build your career. Cloud EMP apps. Most of the job descriptions posted for SA roles, usually yes, they do. Um, and I'm so glad we clarified it. So for cloud EPMS, you know, job descriptions, honestly, I don't even look at them anymore. But in fact, how bad was it? So I don't drink. I mean, four times a year I have a scotch. Once a year, I have a martini, and once a year, I have a glass of wine. And what we actually did is me and my old architect buddies for the last couple of years, we would get together on WebEx or Zoom or sometimes telepresence, and we'd all have a scotch, and we'd all look at the cloud architect job descriptions and laugh, 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 because we knew that nobody, no architect ever had these things. So, yeah, um, that's why we like to clarify cloud EPMS, because we want you getting hired, promoted, paid more, and having a rocket ship career as opposed to wasting your time learning things that are unrelated to the job. Pradeep, is it a great idea to take the cloud engineer course? No, unless you want to be a cloud engineer. No, the tech stuff and take the architects, so you know the tech stuff too. Pradeep, that's the worst thing you can do. If you want to be an airplane pilot, don't become a doctor. 
if you want to become a lawyer, don't learn how to be an airplane pilot. And if you want to be an architect, train to be an architect. If you want to be an engineer, train to be an engineer. Pradeep, I think you don't understand what an architect is. An architect is a digital transformation specialist that is focused on the business. The engineer is focused on the tech. So Pradeep, when I've got engineers with 20 years experience and they want to become cloud architects, they struggle. I mean, they really struggle. Now, once we fix their struggle, then they get great high paying jobs, but they struggle because the engineer is focused on the tech and the architect is focused on the business and the improvement of the business. So if you train to be an engineer, you're training yourself on all the wrong things. It's no different than if you wanted to be a doctor and you learned how to be an airplane mechanic. They're totally unrelated. The architect designs, presents, and sells. The architect's skills are how the pieces and parts fit together. The engineer skills are like, how does this little widget work? And by training on the, how this little widget, you'll make yourselves less employable, lower your salary, and train yourself in all the wrong stuff. So if you want to be an engineer, I strongly recommend you're an engineer. You want to be an architect, I strongly recommend you train to be an architect. For deep, this year, I got people hired. They all had, half of them had no experience. Yvonne Tambo was serving food, and the AWS hired him as a, a waiter. Coyote was uh, a college student who got hired by a waiter. Delroy Bat had, has no cloud certifications, no cloud experience, and he just got hired as a cloud security architect. Jessica, my student, was a behavioral health technician, and she just got a cloud architect job at a big global bank. Daniel Boso didn't graduate high school and is an architect for J.P. Morgan Chase. Jeffrey West, one of those people you saw in the beginning, was a geologist who just got hired as a cloud architect. And the reason they got hired with no experience is we trained them and made them great. And I got to tell you, when I did the reference check and I spoke to the hiring managers, they told me, I love your people because they're not engineers. I am tired of engineers applying for architect jobs. Now, Pradeep, you got to realize this, the architect, this business executive, digital transformation specialist, is a horrible cloud engineer because they're different skills. So here's the thing. If you want to be a cloud engineer, here's your skills. Building the stuff, configuring the stuff, coding Python scripts, coding bash cell scripts, touching Linux and working with Linux, and Terraform, they're, they're engineer skills. Architect skills are design, present, and sell. So by training in somebody else's job, all you're going to do is make you really bad at the job you desire. Train for the job you want. Olympic judo people don't become marathon runners to be good at judo. They do judo. Airplane pilots don't cross-train as flight attendants to learn how to fly a plane. Doctors don't become nurses to learn how to do their job. Strategy consultants don't think it's a good idea to become mechanics. So only in tech do we think we can learn somebody else's job and it's going to make us good at your job. So Pradeep, and I, it's not that I don't want to sell you courses, but I don't want to waste your money. I don't want to see you spend six months on an engineering thing and then have to completely retrain to be an architect and struggle with forgetting all the engineering skills that you worked so hard to develop to learn a completely different set of skills. Because remember, what is the goal of the architect? It's not the tech. I'm going to say this again. The architect is not a techie. The, the tool is the tech. As an architect for deep, here's what your day is going to be like. You're going to go to meeting, 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 have a conversation, entertain your client, buy them lunch, dinners, lunches on your corporate credit card, go to another meeting, and then take a client out for drinks. The next day, you're going to give a presentation. You're going to give an executive briefing. You're going to give another presentation. And you're going to write a thought leader shock document. The day after that, you're going to be taking your customer to dinner and writing documents all day long. The day after that, it'll be eight meetings in the same day. The day after that, so Pradeep, the skills of the architect are meetings, discussions. What I'm doing right now is architect work. You're thinking that an engineer is an architect, and they're not. And that's why we have to remove some of the certifications from people's resumes to get them hired. I could get somebody that comes to me with six XAWS certifications. I have to remove three of them or they won't be hired. Because they'll be viewed as an engineer, not an architect. Now, I love engineers, Pradeep. They're amazing people. But the engineer's focus is the tech. 
The architect focuses on the business. If I need to focus on the business, you need to learn business. You need to learn business. If you want to be an engineer, you need to focus on the tech. So that's why these skills are so different. But great question, Pradeep. I get asked that a lot, and I'm thrilled you answered it. If you've got more questions, please ask them, because I want to help you get to your goals. And then, Chris, we can bring in the next one. Olio. Is the CCNA still a solid certification on a cloud architect resume? Are you still recommending to get experience or something? Like, yeah. So here's the thing. The cloud is a network and a data center. Now, Olio, I don't like associate certifications. I hate them, actually. And I would tell you to get two professional certifications on your resume. I like the CCNP because it's a professional certification. And I like one of the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional or the Azure Solution Architect Expert or the Google Professional Cloud Architect. Now, Olio, here's the thing. We architects never touch the technology ever. So why do I have silly labs like building your own cloud, working with Active Directory, setting up file servers? And here's the reason, Olio. Two things. People are going to want to know if you've ever touched the tech. And if you set up an EC2 instance or create an SD bucket, they're going to laugh at you. They're just going to laugh at you. And they're going to laugh at you because I taught an eight-year-old how to do this in three minutes. And she clicks three buttons and she says, EC2, my friend's daughter, Kriana, she's beautiful and she can do it in three seconds. So because of that, that's why nobody's paying anybody to do, uh, as an architect to do these things. Now, here's the thing. If you built a cloud and you truly built a cloud, you will understand what the cloud is. Where it'll be theoretical in somebody else's mind, it'll be practical in your mind. Now, Olio, I want to make it very clear. When you have no experience, none, you have to prove that you've done it. So we do about 20 AWS labs, 25, 20, 25 Azure labs, and then we do real labs. And I strongly recommend you take our course because our course is $650 on the current special. And the server that you need to do this is $2,000. And that won't include any of the other training. So why would I do this? Why would I have somebody build a cloud? Well, you got two people. My left hand, I did a little website. I did a little WordPress. I set up an S3 bucket. I made an EC2 instance. And you know that person says this to me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, run along, little child. Now you got somebody else that says, I built a cloud. OK, so what do hiring managers want? They want technical competency. Who is more competent? The person that built the cloud or a person that did a little silly AWS though. The person that built the cloud. Now, who is more energetic, more enthusiastic, and passionate about the work? Things that employers care about. I built the cloud. I did a little mini thing in my spare time. No comparison. Employers want someone that's willing to go above and beyond. Who's willing to go above and beyond? I built the cloud. I set up an S3 bucket and a WordPress website. You know, the one person's getting laughed at and the other person's getting hired. So, we're, so really the key is, yes, I still recommend that you either take my course or you buy a $2,000 Xeon system that's going to give you the ability to build your own cloud, build an Active Directory server, really work with server virtualization and containers, LAMP stacks. I really suggest you build your cloud. Because the cloud is too easy. And everybody knows that any eight-year-old or five-year-old, even six-year-old can configure some things on the cloud. So it doesn't hold any value. Build your own cloud. Yeah, that matters. So either buy yourself a server, a Xeon system, minimum 16 cores, minimum 128 gigs around, minimum three SSD drives in a RAID 0 configuration, or an NVMe drive, or take my cores. And if you take our Cloud Architect Career Development Basic course, it's $350. And you'll get to do all these labs on our things and actually learn, as opposed to spending $2,000 for the server yourself. But whether you buy the $2,000 server or take our course, I strongly, 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 um, what do you call it? Uh, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you build a cloud. It's a great question. Yeah, we're still recommending it. My students do it every day. My students get together as groups and build clouds. Leo was doing it with my students the other day in class, and they had so much fun. And employers love it. They just love it. How 
How can you prove your soft skills and business perspective? SS, there's two ways you can do it. Way one would be improving your business skills would be to get an MBA. And that in, in the, and that's what I did. So I, I got a business skills and an MBA, but I also realized this business skills they gave me weren't good enough. So I took what was probably an additional $100,000 of leadership courses. So you basically will need, if you do this, the MBA, you'll need a presentation skills class. You'll need an executive presence class or two. You'll need several CXO relevancy classes. You will need some executive writing courses. You will need some sales courses. And you will need some negotiation courses in addition to the MBA. Or you could take our course, which has got a full mini MBA from a business perspective, an extensive soft skills course, an extensive communication skills course, lots of presentation training, lots of business acumen training. And I did it because I knew this. The average person can't afford that quarter of a million dollar education that I needed to get to be able to teach these skills. And as says, that's why our students do better. Because we're teaching these very expensive skills to our students. And everybody else is trying to learn the tech. So here we're dealing with people, our students are much more technically competent and better business executives, and they're getting hired every day. And then everybody else is going, and they're here. I set up an EC2 instance. I set up an SDR back, and nobody cares because they want an architect, not an engineer. So that's how you do them. You either take the training like that or take our course. Now, realistically speaking, if you wanted to be a cloud architect, the right course is the Cloud Architect Career Development Program for you to teach you that. Now, if you were working as a cloud architect, already, and you were trying to become the CIO, CTO, then we've got a Tech Career Accelerator program that would get you there. And uh, to the second half of your question, you know, how much is the course and how long is it? The course is list price, $9.99. It's currently 35% off, which makes it $6.49 if I did the math correctly in my head. And, you know, the length of it, could be anywhere from four to eight months, depending upon how long it takes you to get hired. And here's the reason why. You know, someone with a good tech background can often do it in four months. Someone with a good management consulting background can often do it in four months. But, you know, we get people from all walks of life. I've gotten people that were working as waiter at food servers hired this year. I've gotten people hired of all backgrounds and all walks of life. Shoe salesman, I've gotten hired this year too as a cloud architect. So it depends on the time, but I'd say about four to eight months. And the course cost is $650. As you can tell, when we're only charging $650, it's because I don't need to work at all. I was totally retired. I've been retired for the decade. I had a great architecture career. And I just did some consulting in my retirement. And I saw what existed out there. I saw the garbage training that was related to cloud computing. And I knew a lot of people wanted to be architects. So I came out of retirement to produce something and sell it for almost our cost, plus a little bit left over to make sure the business is successful, to give all of you your chance to go from wherever you're at to prosperity and have amazing, amazing careers. You know, that's important to us. You know, we get people that have come from $200 a month incomes, and we've had people that get, you know, $275,000 a year jobs right out of the program. We've had some enterprise architects in that world. We took our cloud architect career development program. So we'd love to work with you as us. And I know we could help you get to your goals. Please feel free to ask more questions. Steve M, I'm stuck between the engineer or architect. I don't know which would be the best for your personality. Is the architect the sales role when you must need quota? Yes. Steve, architect roles have quotas attached to it. And the way I like to look at it is as follows. If you enjoy presentations, sales, meetings, entertaining clients, playing golf with clients, taking them to dinners and drinks, becoming a psychologist to the people that work for you, selling things and presenting things in the cloud architect is the best job in the world because it pays better than any of these other jobs. And if you like that, oh, that's great. I'm an introvert, by the way, but you wouldn't know it because I've had a lot of training. Now, by comparison, if you like tech, if you really love tech, you won't be happy as an architect because the reality is we architects never touch the tech. 
you know, my graduates are working at AWS, they're working at Microsoft, they're working at Deloitte, Bearing Point, Cap Gemini, I mean, IBM, Red Hat, you know, they're like, Mike, I never get to touch the tech ever. And that's the key is architects don't touch the tech. So Steve, if you want a design, present, and sell job, and that will make you happy, then the architect job is good. I don't find having a quota to be stressful. Steve, I find the quota the greatest thing. They give me a $50 million quota, and I do $200 million. And the next thing I realize, you can buy an extra house with your bonus. I like that because I'm going to crush whatever the quota is. So to me, a quota isn't stressful. A quota is like, ah, oh, good. There's the bar. It's pretty low. I'm going to go quadruple this and really take care of my family. That's me. I like a challenge. I don't view that stressful. To me, Steve, what's stressful is you ask me to write a Python script, I think I'm going to die because that's not fun for me. That's stress. In fact, I had to take a two-day programming course 20-some years ago. I had a crazy manager back when I was a network engineer that said, Mike, I'd like you to learn to code. And I said, are you aware I'm your most senior person? You have network outages every day before he hired me? And he said, yeah. He said, now that you fix the network, I want you to learn to code. And I said, sure. Can I go somewhere? And he says, yeah, we're going to send you to Boston, unlimited expense account. I went on a free vacation with my wife. When I went over to there, they had an outage. And you know, the person that sent me there to learn to code got fired because you don't send your architects and engineers to do these little things. But there was that. So the key is, if you want to touch the tech, be a cloud engineer. It's a great job. It really is. If you want to design, present, and sell, be an architect. It's a really great job. The key is what's right for your personality. Do you focus on, want to focus on the tech? Be an engineer. Do you want to focus on the business? Be an architect. See, I like to look at it this way. Business executive, and that's really what we're talking about with a good cloud architect, versus technology professional. What do you want to be? They're both great. They're both great. Now, being on the architect side, you can earn a lot more. And the reason you'll earn a lot more is you're bringing money into the business because you're in sales. Being on the engineering side, you'll earn less because you're expensed to the company. Being in the architect side, if there's a downturn in the economy, they need more of you architects because you're selling. In a downturn economic economy, you know, engineering jobs may get outsourced to other lower cost countries. But the point is they're both great jobs. They're really, really great jobs. Both great jobs. The key is finding out what is actually like. Because if you don't think being an executive is good with your personality, it's not going to be. Unless you want to train to be an executive. Because none of us are born with these skills. But do what makes you happy. They are both, both, both fantastic jobs. Excellent. Give us a hashtag cloud hired in the chat box. And bring in some more questions for Deep. I think for the not doctor versus nurse example was awesome. You get it now. The nurse takes the vital signs to find out what the problem is, and the doctor tells you the solution. So, Pradeep, I used to practice medicine many years ago. So, I was on the doctor side as a nurse practitioner and on the nursing side. And here's the difference as a doctor the pa or a nurse practitioner, the patient comes to me. I interview them, I ask some questions, I make a diagnosis, and I build a treatment plan. Here's the plan. Now, the nurse at the hospital carries out that plan, and that's the difference. The nurse is doing the engineering job or the work, and the doctor's building the plan. The nurse might collect information and give it to the doctor so the doctor can make a better decision. Exactly. The same way I may get a team of cloud engineers to baseline the organization systems and give me their findings so I can make a design. That's exactly what's going on for deep. And that's why I was trying to tell you it's not an advantage to learn somebody else's job at all. And here's why. And some people would think it is. But if I know their job, I'll be able to help them do their job better. And in theory, that would be true. But here's the problem, Padeep. Every minute you're learning somebody else's job, do you know what you're not learning? Yours. So every minute that's spent with somebody else and their careers, you're not learning yours. Now, Pradeep, your smart competition, the people that are going to win and get hired, or focused on their career, not somebody else's. Because just imagine this. You come to me on an interview. I've got 50 years experience as, a, as an engineer, Mike. And I say, great. How do I design this? And you can't answer it. And I ask you to communicate it, and you can't answer it. Do I have any interest in your engineering background? None, because it's a different job. Now, you show me how you can design something. Oh, you know. 
that's now you're in a great, 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 great shape. So good, I'm glad you got it, Pradeep, because it's very important. And we see people, especially when they come from big tech backgrounds, they still want to learn the engineering. And they don't realize how different it is from the architect of and how much it actually may hurt them versus helping. Good question, Pradeep. Bring in some more questions, everyone. I'll do anything I can to assist you. Akeem, in your experience, what's the most difficult part of being a cloud architect? Akeem, you know what? Realistically speaking, for me, it was pretty natural. Now, I'll tell you where people struggle because I've coached more architects than you can imagine. Akeem, I studied medicine. That was my, uh, my background. So in medicine, what do you do? You meet with a client. You ask them some questions. It's called taking a history. You do a physical exam, which is basically looking at their systems. You make a diagnosis and a treatment plan. Now, Hakeem, what does an architect do? They meet with a client. They ask some questions. They bring in a team of engineers to baseline the systems. They make a diagnosis and make a plan. Hmm. Doctor interview a patient. Architect interview a client. Doctor asks some questions. Architect asks some questions. Doctor uh, do an exam. Architect bring in some engineers to do the exam. Doctor make a diagnosis. Architect make a diagnosis. Doctor make a plan, which is usually a prescription. Architect make a plan called an architecture. So for a doctor to become an architect, it's nothing. How about a management consultant, Akeem? Best background, by the way. Management consultant interviews a client. They ask about their business goals, their business pain points, their challenges. They then examine workflows, people, processes, and technology to make a diagnosis, and they make a plan called the business architecture. So that's really, so when you've got people that know how to speak, know how to present, psychologists, professors, teachers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, it's very simple for them to be a cloud architect because all they have to do is learn the technology. And the technology is relatively easy. Now, where do most people have a hard time? Most people are tech obsessed. And they're not focusing on how the tech works or why we use it or how to design it. They're busy focused on configuring. Now, cloud architects don't configure anything ever. So here's the way it works. You're at AWS. You're at Microsoft. You're at IBM. You're at Deloitte. You're at Capgemini. You're at Google. You're at Verizon. You're at Cisco. And we've got graduates working in all these places. Here's the thing or Apple, we've got students working over, graduates working everywhere. In this job, they're going to design it by meeting with the client, asking some questions, bringing in a team of engineers to baseline it, making a diagnosis and a plan. Now, Hakeem, once they're done, it goes to a build team of cloud engineers and sysadmins that build it. We never touch the tech. So what the biggest challenge is, is most people are focused on becoming certified. And certification is the worst preparation for architecture careers, and here's why. Certification is the name of the service, which we can't use in half of the cases because it's proprietary, and how to configure that service. Architects don't touch the technology or configure. So, Hakeem, I think becoming an architect is simple. I get students hired every single day of the week because we know what to train them. So where people struggle is they misunderstand the architect role. They think it's an engineer, and they train to be an engineer. And what it's really like in these situations, Hakeem, is people want what they want. So I'll give you an example. I did something stupid that offended my wife about two years ago. I wanted to make her smile, right? My wife loves cats. I love dogs, by the way, or at least I used to. So I went to the rescue place that had cats and dogs to get my wife a cat because I knew it would make her smile. Now, Hakeem, when I was there, I love dogs, okay? This beautiful golden retriever started licking me and it sat down next to me and it wouldn't leave me and I love this golden retriever. But at the end, no matter how much I liked the Golden Retriever King, Akeem, I, need, I went there with the intention to buy a cat. So what did I do? I brought home a cat for my wife, who she loves, by the way, and I love too. The cat even sleeps in my feet, on my head. She's everywhere, and she's beautiful in every way. She even practices yoga with me each day. But the point is, is I went in there with the intention of hiring a cat, and I hired a cat. If I wanted a dog, I'd go with the dog intention and hire a dog. So Akeem, where everybody messes it up is they get SysOp certifications, and that makes them unhirable. They're studying DevOps, and that makes them look bad because they look like DevOps engineers, not architects. They study tech, 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 tech. 
And after that, guess what? They don't know any transformation. No any transformation. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. SS, our course is four to eight months long. The course is $9.99, but we currently have a 35% off sale, which will make it $6.49 and change if I did the math correctly in my head. And that makes it uh, 227 per month for three months on a payment plan as well. To come. What soft skills do you work do you need to work on to become a senior cloud engineer? No, comment as a senior engineer, it's le less about soft skills as, as an engineer, but still they're going to be helpful to you. And here's the thing. If you want to go from senior engineer to principal engineer, then it's a lot of soft skills. But regular engineer to senior engineer, I may have you may actually be able to get that straight out of my program, depending upon who you are and how, how well you master it. Now I'm gonna tell you this. If you're emotionally intelligent, you will earn far more in your career. Far more in your career. If you're empathetic to others, you will earn far more in your career. If you can explain technology well to others, you will earn far more in your engineering career. If you've got some degree of business acumen, which lets you understand what is the tech and how does it work and how does it impact the business, you will earn much more in your tech career. If you've got good presentation skills as an engineer, and that's why my engineering career was like a rocket ship. I was only an engineer for six months before I was an architect, and that was 20 years ago then if your presentation skills are there, your writing skills are there. But it's really about how do you make others feel? You know, it's kind of interesting. You know, at the end of the day, if you speak to a thousand people, they may not remember what you said to them, although they possibly will, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So given that it probably takes the same amount of effort to be nice to someone as it does to be nasty to them, I'd say stay positive. So what are we really looking for in the perfect person? Honesty, integrity, trust, responsiveness, responsibility, delivering things what you promise on time and on budget. And a calm, those are really the things that really, really matter. How do you solve your customers' problems? Can you can do it consistently, reliability, and can you be there? So Kam, I have a really good friend. She's been hiring engineers forever. And Akam, I've literally asked every hiring manager you can think of for 25 years, what do you want in the perfect network engineer, cloud engineer, cloud architect, enterprise architect? You know, I've been a coach, right? So I just ask every manager what you want. Because if we can graduate students that are what the hiring managers want, they get hired every day. And what they tell me is, you know, sounds pretty, pretty abysmal. Mike, I want someone that can do the job and somebody that I can tolerate. I said, what do you mean tolerate? And they say, we get people that can talk, put sentences together. They're mean, they're nasty, and they're negative. I want someone that can do the job and somebody that I can tolerate. So come, you go in there with a good attitude, a good energy, a good enthusiasm, competency, knowledge of what you know and what you don't know. You learn how to bring out the best in others. You present well. You get CXO relevant. You develop some executive presence. Wow, a calm. Now you're not a $110,000 engineer. Now you're a quarter of a million dollar engineer. So those are the skills. The same ones the architects have, actually. And that's the key. So if you deal with companies, they have distinguished engineers and principal engineers. These are not only people that are very smart technically, but they've got the business, business, business. And at the low end, you know, engineers are all techies. At the low end, architects, they could be 2% techies. At the high end, your architects are all business, 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 business with a little bit of tech. And at the high end, your engineers, they become half business and half tech too. They're just closer to the tech. And as the engineers become principal engineers and distinguished engineers, you know what they do less of? Touching the tech. Touching the tech. And here's the reason why. Now they're in a position where they're going to be advising other engineers just like the architects. So kind of keep that in the back, uh, back of your program. So there's that. 
Good question. Stephen, hi, Mike. You would like to know how to build a personal project and portfolio as a cloud architect to get experience as a software journey. Stephen, you need to know what is an architect. You need to understand all the digital transformation that architects do, all the business things that architects do, all the communication skills that architects have, all the leadership things that they have, all the sales skills that the people have. You got to be able to understand that because without that, you're not going to be able to build any projects that matter because what problems are you trying to solve? Now, you could take our course and learn all these things. And you can actually do the projects that we recommend. Or, Stephen, you can go spend a couple thousand dollars on the server to do the projects to build your thing, which is going to be much more expensive than our course, so it's up to you. Now, kind of projects that are going to work is you should set up server virtualization. You should understand how it works. You should build some containers from scratch. You should create file servers with NFS, file servers with the server message block. You should create Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP web stacks on real servers, not little silly business in the cloud. Because you got to do it the hard way. You should be setting up firewalls and working with it, VPN concentrators and working with it. Set up an Active Directory server, work with it. Build the cloud, work with it. But remember, architects design, present, and sell, not configure, Steve. So make sure you've got the business pieces. Write some thought leadership documents because that matters more than your technical hands-on things. Write some documents that shape the industry. Show people how this technology solution will go solve a business problem. That's a portfolio. That's a portfolio. What's not a portfolio is a bunch of tech stuff because architects design, present, and sell. So Stephen, the first thing that you need to know is truly understand what the job is. And then make sure that the things on your resume and the things in your portfolio are exactly in line with what the architect actually does. So that's there. So a portfolio might include presentations, thought leadership documents that you've written. That's part of your portfolio. And it's going to be much less technical and much more business. Because you've got to remember, architects design, present, and sell. So your portfolio should show that you've got expertise in design, presentation skills, and sales skills. That's your portfolio. That's your portfolio. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So get good on that. Get good on showing that you are the master of designing technology solutions to solve business problems. That's what you do. That's my students write books. That's why my students teach courses. That's why my students write thought leadership documents with me because they need a platform to show that they are amazing. That's what you do. It's not a tech thing, although I would still build the cloud and show why. Mostly non-technical. Now, if you were an engineer, your portfolio would look totally different. It would be all these engineering things. And that's why you've got to be laser focused on the actual job with whatever you do. Hope I answered your question there. And please feel free to ask a subsequent question if I didn't answer it thoroughly enough. <clears throat> how to answer a question in an interview if you don't know how to respect what the technical thing would be taken as negative. E.g., I am in tech, but I know databases. SS, nobody expects you to know everything. No one does. Now, I'm going to tell you, every job that I've ever been hired on, I use this answer. I'm sorry, I've not had the opportunity to learn that technology yet or work with the technology yet. But I'm highly energetic, I'm highly enthusiastic, and I absolutely love technology. I know what I know, and I know what I don't I, I know how to find the answers to things that I don't know very quickly. And if you'd like to check my competency, we can talk about BGP, OSPF, and PIM sparse mode. Why? Because here's what we just did. What do employers want, SS? They want someone that is competent, energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate, knows what they know, and knows what they don't know. Find the information things quickly. They're looking for someone that's willing to go above and beyond, be a great team player, and on this, because most people kill their interview by lying. So if I've said, I'm sorry, I've not had the opportunity to learn that technology yet, but I'm highly energetic, I'm highly enthusiastic, 
I'm highly motivated and I absolutely love technology. I know what I know and I know what I don't know and I can find the answers to things quickly. If this was important to you, I'd stay up all night, read a thousand pages a day until I was an expert. But I just want to make sure we built an open and honest relationship. Now, what did I do? Did I tell them that I, I knew what I knew and knew what I didn't know? Sure. Did I show them you could trust me? Sure. Did I tell them that I was energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate, which is what the employers want? Yes. Did I show them I was willing to go above and beyond? Yes. Now, SS, I did that on my first interview. And I was interviewing to be a network engineer. I had no tech background whatsoever. I got hired as a senior network engineer for $22,000 more than I asked for. And the point is that, 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 that's what the key. So show that you know what you know and know what you don't know. They don't expect you to know anything, everything. They expect you to know your job and know what you know and know what you know. So SS, architecture is a team sport. Here's what it looks like, a normal environment for me. I go talk to a client, right? I get a lot of requirements and I go, uh-oh, this is the job for 600 people. And I go back to the company that I work for and then I go to the CEO and I quantify the value of my thing and say, I need 50 resources because they're going to be 50, 250,000 dollars your resources. So it's going to take, I have to get these people. So I start at the CEO, then I go to some of the executive vice presidents and I ask them to the lonely people. And when the architecture comes, I get everybody in a room or everybody on a WebEx or Zoom session or what have you, telepresence. And then I hire some IM architects, some network security architects, some cloud architects, some database administrators. We get in some DevOps engineers, some cloud engineers, some IAM architects again and again and again. And together, we all design it together. Now together, I then take that design, I write it up in a document, I write it up in a PowerPoint. I may even send it to a graphics team to make the little thing that I created either a Visio, Draw.io, or Lucidchart look better in Adobe InDesign. I present it back to the customer, I sell it to that customer, I negotiate the deal, and then I hand it off to an engineering team. So they know that you don't know everything, SS, it could take you 25 years to just master networking, 50 years for someone mastering networking. And that's the key. The key is it, be good at your job and focus on your job. Focus on the things that you like. See, I come from medicine, SS. You know, I practice internal medicine, right? You know, I know internal medicine. I don't know orthopedics like an orthopedic surgeon. I don't know rheumatology like a rheumatologist. I don't know neurology like a neurologist. I don't know nephrology like a nephrologist. So what do I do as an internal medicine practitioner? I get everybody else together. Here, consult cardiology, consult nephrology, consult PT, consult hematology. It's the same job. So don't try to answer questions that you don't know. Answer them in an open, honest, and ethical manner there. Now show them instead. When you're done that thing, so, for example, when I say, if I was part of your team, I would stay up all night to learn it. But if you'd like to check my competency, guess what? You can talk to me about cloud networking, BGP, OSPF, or load balancers, or security. And I'd love to have that discussion to discuss our competency. So, show them that you're open and honest. And they're not going to lie to them. Highlight all the things that you do, which is why they need to have you on their team. And then point them to your degrees of competency. So you convince them you are what they need. In addition to that, SS, you then pointed them to the things that you're an expertise, which means you psychologically planted the seeds for them to interview you on where your expertise lies. Because most hiring managers care, can you learn? You interview 5,000 people, SS, you may be, if you're lucky, able to hire two or three. And half of those may not even know the skill, but you're looking for the right attitude, energy, enthusiasm, intelligence, and ability to learn. Great question, SS. Please feel free to ask more. Let me go to the next question. Paul Gray, you are learning the solution architect associate. You work in the telecommunity industry in Nigeria as an analyst and you want to switch to an architect. Please tell me how to go to it. So Paul, the first thing you need to realize is the AWS certified solution architect professional is approximately five to 10% of all that's necessary to become a cloud architect. So realize that the certification is just the beginning. It's the entry level. 
So the things that you're going to need to realize is that, Paul, is the architect is a business executive, and it's a design, present, and sell job. Now, the good news is you said telecommuting or telecommunications, so hopefully you have some networking knowledge because that's a big part of it. So, Paul, the things that you're going to need to learn are going to be as follows. BGP, how to tune in IBGP, EBGP, et cetera. You should know an interior gateway protocol at minimum OSPF. You should know IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route aggregation. You should know NAT, one-to-one -one NAT, one-to-many NAT, static NAT, dynamic NAT, PAT, or NAT overload. You should know WAN technologies, which you may already know, such as uh, SSL-based VPNs, IPsec-based tunnels, private lines, Ethernet over MPLS, software-defined networking, and SASE. You should know a good knowledge about switching, VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, port channel, ether channel, link aggregation groups, those kind of things. You should have some knowledge of fiber optic communications, especially things like unilateral link detection, things when the systems go down. Now, what else do you need to know on that on the networking side? ARP, proxy ARP, DNS, DHCP. Now on the data center side, you're gonna need to have good knowledge of servers and server virtualization, containers and container orchestration, storage area networks such as block storage, object storage, file storage, and not the intro junior level stuff that's in the certified solution architect professional, but real knowledge in depth. You need to know load balancers, application load balancers, network load balancers, when to use them, when to stack them, those kind of things. Business applications such as CRM systems, ERP systems, unified communication systems, supply chain systems, et cetera. Then you need to understand firewalls, next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, VPN concentrators. Probably some, some knowledge of, soft, of, uh, of content delivery networks as well. Now that's your tech piece. Now, Paul, you got to remember, the remaining stuff is non-technical. And the non-technical is much more important than the actual technical. And the way this works is as follows. You need to be able to sell, so you're going to need good sales skills. You're going to need to understand business acumen, meaning how do you do a re return on investment capital model to show the customer the value or solution is greater than its cost. Now, you'll be presenting at conferences, um, so you're going to have to have some great presentation skills, some great sales skills, some great leadership skills. You're going to be dealing with CEOs, CFOs, CTOs, and CIOs every day, so you're going to need something called CXO relevancy. And again, these things are what do you say to the CTO versus the CFO versus the CIO? Now, you're also going to realize when you deal with the leadership, you're going to have three personality types. You're going to deal with intuitive leaders like me, analytical leaders like my chief operating officer, Chris, as well as people that are going to be more functional or process based. And you've got to communicate to them because leaders hit those sides. If you go to an intuitive leader like me and start talking numbers, I get a headache. But if you start talking, you know, the vision to Chris, he's going to get a headache, even though he's quite smart and can do vision. But the point is, is we're different kind of leaders and we think differently, so that really matters. So make sure you also understand how to sell. And it's not selling on emotions like we sell cars. It's selling based upon business cases. Those are the skills that you're going to need to learn to become an architect. That's exactly how you do it. Now, you can do it in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Or you can do like an MBA for the business piece if you're not training with us. And then you can, you know, take some system design courses. They're going to be very expensive though, Paul. And that's why we created ours. Because these system design courses are very expensive. And that's why we have ours. But that's the process. Train with us, train without us. And Paul, you know, on Thursday too, I'm going to have a complete how to get your first cloud job webinar. And I will tell you explicitly every one of these things you need to know. And if you join this on this, you will have a list of everything you need to learn. Train with us, train on your own. You'll know exactly, exactly the list because I'll go through it in depth. Do we have any scholarship plans or pay after hire plans? Absolutely not. We pick the price that anyone anywhere in the world can afford, and the price is explicitly stated on the website. We've got lots of people that have gotten hired with no experience. I could give you list after list. Jeffrey West was one of them. He was a geologist. Daniel Bosu didn't even graduate high school, and he's working as a cloud architect. Delroy Bad has an associate degree, not, and he's working as a cloud security architect. Jessica was a psychologist working as a cloud, is working as a cloud architect now. Uh, Bal Winder was a stay-at-home mom who's now working at Microsoft as a solutions architect. 
Yvonne was working as a food server before he got a cloud architect role. Uh, Coyote was actually working as a college student at the time. We got all hired with no experience. For deep, it's a matter of what gets you hired? Having the exact right skills. The exact right skills. So there's that. But no, we don't have any scholarships. We are, there's no negotiation of our prices. It's completely on the website. We picked the cheapest price we could possibly offer it for, which is basically our cost. And that's what it is. We don't do any kind of, you know, pay after hire because I don't, I don't, it doesn't feel good to me. Like, I don't want to tell somebody my course is 20 grand, like these other people, 30 or 40. And then somebody graduates and they owe us a lot of money. You know, right now we're charging basically nothing. One day's pay for the average graduate, two for, for people that are in, in the developing nation. So we're doing developing nations. So we're charging basically one to two days grip pay. You know, there's no reason for us to, to do anything that would not be good for people. It's not who we are. We would change lives for the better and not burden people down with debt or things like that. So that's why we don't do those kind of things. Chris, you can go to the next question. And it's a fair question to ask. VP, Cloud Architect program is more suited for people with an infrastructure background. VP, I got, I got food servers and doctors and nurses taking it. Can we create a program for software developers? No, um, we don't do software developers because then they'd be application architects, not cloud architects. We have cloud architects, which design an end-to-end -end solution. What you're asking for is a software developer thing. So VP, here's all the reasons we stay away from software. I will work very hard never to teach an application anything, and here's the reason why. We're trying to create people, give them jobs that have opportunities of high income and lots of money. Software development in our world is the worst career you could possibly end up in. Here's the reason why. In college, they teach software programming to everybody. So when you look at a supply and demand curve, the greater the supply, the lower the salary. The greater the, the, greater the demand and lower the supply, the greater the salary. Everybody knows how to code because they're taught in college, which means application architect salaries are half of cloud architect salaries. So we don't want to create a low paid um, architect program. Now, the second side of this is this. The most risky in danger position in the world is anything on the software side. And here's the reason why. The US economy is in a significant recession right now. We had two negative quarters of GDP growth with upwards of 10% inflation. I mean, that means the negative GDP growth in real dollars is like negative 10%. Huge, horrible numbers. Now, who gets laid off? Cloud architects, we're still getting hired, and here's the reason why. People are paying us to transform their business. Now, I've got a $200,000 application architect in the US, fired, replaced by a $25,000 application architect in India. That's why we don't teach software development, because software is going to be outsourced to the lowest cost parts of the world. We only focus on careers where we can really give people like a rocket ship career. And software, in my mind, is the most risky, lowest paying, most dangerous place to be long term. And that's why we won't create a course here. We will create courses in places that offer opportunities for our students because we want to change lives. Many of my students tell me they get a $100,000 raise from their previous job once we get them hired. And I want to do that. And I can't do that on the application architect side. Plus, I'm not a, a software developer. So because I don't want people to graduate our programs with low paying jobs, because I want people to graduate our programs and everybody get hired, I stay away from the most dangerous careers. And this in my mind is one of the most dangerous careers. So our program is designed to take people from no background or software developer background and make them great cloud architects. But a cloud architect is end to end. An application architect only focuses on one thing, which is the applications. It's not our focus, not our world. So that's why we're not gonna be teaching that. We want to teach programs where we can maximize people's lives and really help that. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Not our world. Kim. Hello, Mike. Got your cloud practitioner last week. Great. You just got your SAA. Great. What kind of entry-level job can you want? Can you get? Based upon passing two certifications, there's nothing that you could actually do with it. But, you know, if you're taking our live classes, very quickly you'll be able to get the skills that you need. 
here's the thing. There is no job where you just configure stuff, which is what they teach them about. None. So there's not much you can do with it. Now, if, if, if you know how to design, present, and sell, then you could easily get a cloud architect job. And we've had people with zero cloud certifications that have gotten cloud architect jobs. If, by comparison, Anakin, you have great strong Python skills, great Terraform skills, extremely good Linux skills, and good cloud engineering skills, then you can get a cloud architect job. But again, that's related to the training. It has nothing to do with your certification. All the certification is the name of a service and how to configure it. And there's no jobs from that. Not at all. Now, 20 years ago, you could get a certification and get a job. But here's what's different between now and 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if you did a certification, you had to know something. Because you'd buy the books, you'd read the books. Or you would take the kind of course that I teach, taught by somebody with years of experience. Now, Anakin, when I took my first certification courses, I spent 20 grand. 20,000 US dollars back in 1996 for an MCSC course and a CCNP course. And I got some good instruction. This is not today's world of Udemy and uh, all those silly certification providers that are teaching nonsense that they don't even understand. That when you take their course, what you hear is blah, 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 because they don't understand it. So certifications alone will get you nothing, but knowledge will. So, Anakin, here's what you need to do. Um, for right now, I would say master your cloud engineering or architect skills. You can try to look for a job, but you're not going to get one. So I would probably do some additional kind of part-time job and something that's easy for you to do that's not going to fatigue you while you focus on being a cloud architect or cloud engineer. Because it will probably take you with just certifications one to two years if you're lucky to get a junior level job because there's nothing based upon certifications to get anybody hired. So it will take you longer to try and find a junior $30,000 job based on certifications than it would for you to get a $150,000 job or a hundred to $150,000 job out of a program. So I suggest you focus on learning the right skills, becoming great at what you do, and you'll be there. That's what I would strongly recommend. And take a job in another industry while you're waiting to get your real job. And if you get lucky, sure, you can get hired. But in my experience, you know, certified solution architect professionals are completely unhirable until they have these other skills. So if you've got these other skills, and like I said, if you're an engineer and want to be an engineer, if you've got deep Python and deep knowledge of the command line and deep knowledge of Linux, like a Linux engineer, and deep knowledge of Terraform and deep knowledge of networking and deep knowledge of data center stuff, then they can yeah, go out there and get a cloud engineer job. And if you happen to have really good business acumen and leadership skills, and sales skills, and executive presence, and BGP knowledge, OSPF knowledge, IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, et cetera, all those kind of things. And you could potentially do an architect role. But you just mentioned certifications. And as I always say, certifications will never get anybody a job. Never. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. That's not true. The Cisco certified internet expert, that is enough to get a job on its own. But that's about 75,000 pages of reading and between ten dollars and $40,000 to pass that certification. Even the exams, like just flying out to take the exam and staying in a hotel and paying for the exam is three dollars $4,000 without the training. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But do our training, we'll get you where your goals. Chris, go to the next one. I hate saying that. It's just the certifications don't mean much. Keish. What do you advise someone older age in their 40s? That's not older age. You're probably younger than me. Coming from a healthcare background, wanting to get into cloud engineering. So, Keish, realize this. It is not too late. I work with 60-year-olds, and we can get them hired, too. Now, Keish, what you really need to think of is, do you want to be a cloud engineer, or do you want to be an architect? And if you're coming from a healthcare background, chances are you've already prepared for, engineer, for architecture work and not engineer. So I want you to think about this. What is the ideal cloud architect? Someone with good communication skills. Someone with some leadership skills. Someone with high degrees of emotional intelligence. High degrees. Someone with excellent communication skills. Someone with sales skills. Presentation skills. Now in healthcare, we got to make patients take medications they don't want to take. 
We got to convince them to adhere to a treatment plan they don't want to take. We have to deliver bad news all the time. Emotional intelligence is critical for our job. Presenting information to doctors and nurses, oh my God, it's so critical. So Keish, you're probably 50% trained all the way to a cloud architect. And when we deal with medical people and nurses and doctors, we, we say that, look, I can make you a cloud engineer or a cloud architect, but Keish, it'll be a lot faster to get you to become a cloud architect than a cloud engineer. And you'll earn double over the life of it, especially with a healthcare background. I come from a healthcare background. I used to practice internal medicine. That's my background. Now, if you wanted to become a cloud engineer, that is still fine, but realize this. The work that you've done in healthcare, the soft skills, the emotional intelligence, those communication skills, which are half of the healthcare job, will be much less beneficial to you in engineering. So for you to go to engineering, you're going to have to learn both the cloud, which means the network and the data center, all those things that we talked about. Then you're going to have to become an expert at configuring these things on the command line and the management console. Then you're going to have to master Linux engineering to be a cloud engineer. After you master Linux engineering, you're going to have to get good at Python programming. After you do that, you're going to have to write some bash style scripting. So you've got a choice, architect or engineer. You could do either, but you'll be able to get an architect job much easier. You'll get paid more for it because it's going to leverage your special secret weapons healthcare skills. So you can do either. We've got a cloud engineer program that'll get you cloud hired, a cloud architecture program that'll get you cloud hired. But if you're coming from healthcare and you'd like to maximize the relevancy of your past experience to show that you've got real experience on your interview, become an architect and not an engineer. Because healthcare is architecture. Everything we do in healthcare, building a treatment plan for somebody is architecture. So no, you're not too young. Yes, you can easily do it. It took me about six months to go from practicing internal medicine to lead architect at the world's largest internet service provider in the world. So you can do it. And I got to tell you, because my medical background, I had reached levels in architecture inside of 10 years that most people, inside of a year, that most people wouldn't get to in 10 to 15 years. So whatever you like, is good, but and keep that in the back of your mind. You love engineering, you can do it. It's not too late. But with your assets from healthcare, architecture would be much easier for you to get hired and paid more. So I'd be a cloud architect. And we've got a great cloud architect career development program. And I get people all the time. The, two weeks ago, it was Jessica. She was a mental health tech. And she got her first cloud architect job. And she was super excited. And I will tell you this. It was a massive raise over her healthcare salary because you've got that background. Again, both are good, but I really think you should be an architect if you come from healthcare. I think it'll be much easier for you and you'll capitalize on your very hard to develop healthcare strength. And I love healthcare people and working with them. I am one myself and that's why I answered this. So thank you for your question. Please feel free to ask more. Chris or Chow or whoever's behind the scenes. Purdue. When you say architecture, design, and sell, do you go hunting out for possible prospective clients? Thankfully, we don't do that. Are those cool vibes provided for you? We just present and sell. Yeah, we get the people. So when all these companies, what you're going to have is inside sales reps, and they're basically going to be low-paid sales reps that actually call and arrange the meetings for you. They'll also be inside sales engineers and inside solution architects, which are people that will build your bills and materials. Now, they will arrange new customer meetings, you will be associated with a technical account manager or a sales rep. They will find the meetings. They will do the intro stuff, and then they will bring you with them because they won't know how any of the tech works. So the way this works is you've got the sales rep and their Armani suits, kind of manage the relationship, and you help sell the technical solution while they help sell the business piece. Now, Pradeep, if you're like me, you'll do the business things and the tech things. I will go with a sales rep, without a sales rep. I don't care, and I'll still close the deal. But that's just me. But no, we don't have to do cold calls and start calling people. Hey, you want to talk to us? Hey, you want to talk to us? Thankfully, that's somebody else's job. All we got to do is show up, talk to people, impress them, wow them, 
and really be able to put them in a position where they know that you can solve their business problems. Great position to do for DeepEd. Thankfully, no, we don't have to go hunt for them. Please feel free to ask some questions in the chat box so I can help you guys. Ciao or Chris, go to the next one. Cloud EPMS, no doubt 999 is overly considerate, but please can the 35% be extended for at least a week or two? Absolutely not. So Cloud EPMS, we picked a time. It's a very short flash sale. We can't afford to do it too long if we choose to stay in business and get our students hired. Now, we created a payment plan for this, which makes it to $227 for three months, and you can definitely do that. But unfortunately, we're not in a position to be extending the sale after today. It's just not something we can financially sustain and do. So, no, it will end tonight at midnight. But you can sign up at midnight and use the payment plan, which will give you three payments. Uh, there's just no way we can make it any cheaper. I have four people with master's degrees on staff to make sure my students do well. Three of them are MBAs. And, you know, I have a team of the world's greatest people to make sure that everybody's successful. I can't make it any cheaper than it is. We've sucked our costs down to pretty much and sell it at our cost, so we can't uh, we can't uh, we can't extend the sale any longer. But please take advantage of the uh, thirty five percent off sale. Use it on a payment plan. You don't have to come up with all the money in one day. So please, folks, ask some questions so we can truthfully help you get to your goals. And before we get to the next one, please make sure that you come to Thursday's How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. I want to make sure that all of you have all the tools you need to get hired. And ask them some questions in the chat box. I got a couple more minutes. I got like 30 more minutes. So, or 20, 30 more minutes. I want to give you guys as much as I can to help you build your best career. QBiz. Hello, Mike. Based upon your perspective of software development, do you think it will be risky to learn DevOps engineering, or is the cloud safest bet? Now, QBiz, DevOps engineering is a unique position, and here's why. I don't like software development careers. I'm going to make, I've made that abundantly clear. I think it's too much of a commodity. There's too much competition, and I don't like the supply and demand curves and salary curves at all. Now, having said that, I still like DevOps engineering. And here's the reason why. What is DevOps? DevOps is a means to automate things. So automation of software release cycles, automation of building out the cloud. So the reason I tell people there's no job for a cloud certified person only is the reason. I can hire one DevOps engineer, one of them, and they can replace 50 cloud admins that will be clicking on buttons on the management console. So just for that, that makes all those little silly certification, intra-level, junior-level jobs not available. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. There's that. So I don't like software careers. Now, DevOps is going to be removing all those junior people's jobs. One DevOps engineer, get rid of 50 employees. 50, so that makes it very good. So in a good economy, DevOps is great. In a bad economy, DevOps is great. But here's the question. I want you to really think about this from a perspective. As an architect, I need to be able to communicate with the person. Get in the same room, for example, and have a conversation. As an engineer, does it matter where I exist anywhere in the world? The answer is not. So because the, the DevOps engineer can be anywhere in the world, and I, I like... I watch the cookie monster, so I like things that begin with a C. Does it make does it matter whether you're in Cambodia, Cameroon, Cape Town, Cuba, Cancun, Cayman Islands, Chicago, California, or I can't think of another thing with a C in it right now, but I'm sure it'll pop in my head later. So the point is, is because of that, I can hire a DevOps engineer for thirty thousand dollars a year somewhere else in the world and get a rock star. So if the economy tanks, think of remember that these DevOps engineers can be anywhere in the world at a much lower cost. So I would strongly suggest 
cloud architecture if you're worried about long-term future careers and high salaries. Now, if you love tech, whether you're a cloud engineer or a DevOps engineer, you can still be outsourced anywhere in the world. Now, that's the risk of all these engineering careers. Does it matter if my engineer is in Bangalore or Barbados? No. Probably cheaper in Bangalore than Barbados because Barbados is expensive. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind that that's why I really prefer these careers that are unoutsourceable whenever possible. But I love cloud engineering and I still love DevOps engineering. I think they're great careers, two of them. Now, we don't teach DevOps engineering because I am not a software developer. And if you're not a software developer, don't be a DevOps engineer because you really should be a good full stack developer before you become a DevOps engineer. Because you got to be a developer. This is a development career. So, you know, it's all about that. It's really about what do you like? Cloud architecture is going to be your safest bet. Because in a bad economy, we need more of them to transform the business. Engineering roles in a bad economy cost the company money. So let me explain the difference, Cubos. I'm an architect. I'm working for Cisco, right? I was an architect, worked for Cisco. I meet with a client. I bring in a $50 million purchase order. Let's say there's 50% margins on that. I just made the company $25 million after expenses. Now, Cubis, I might do that 10 times for a year as a good architect. So I'm bringing in a quarter of a billion dollars in a year. 100 million, something big like that. Now, if I ask them to pay me a million bucks and I just brought in, you know, a hundred million dollars a year, of which 50 million of it is profit, can, can they pay me that? Of course, it's nothing to them. Now, now let's look at the engineer. I go sell the thing, right? Sell the thing. And because of this, somebody else builds it, those cloud engineers build it. They're critically important people, but is, are they a source of money to the company? No, they're an expense. So realize in a down economy, in a recession, back-end engineering course, things get outsourced to people they can do it better, faster, and cheaper. But architect roles, you still need to be local. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But yeah, so they're both good. That's the point. When does your next batch? We don't do batches ever. I think batches are the worst idea, and here's why we don't do them. The people that have signed up today, and lots of people have signed up today, all radically started training today, and they will be rolled into our next class tomorrow, live and in person. Here's why I don't do batches. For the following reason. In a batch, you join today, right? 16 weeks later, you're done. And if you're hired, great. And if you're unhired, who cares? That's why people do batches. They get them in, get them out, crank them in and out like a mill, and nobody cares. I refuse to do that. I don't do batches. I get you in the way you train a doctor, the way you train a martial artist. Fourth-year residents with third-year residents and second-year residents and first-year residents. So if you sign up today, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a welcome to Go Cloud Careers email. Here's what's going to happen. In that email, you will start the live, on-demand, self-paced training that begins with just you. You'll be turning in, you'll be watching a video, reading, a, reading an assignment, turning it in, and getting feedback. So there's that. All self-paced as fast as you can get through it. If you need four months to get through, or you need 12 months to get through, I don't care. You have up to a year or until you are hired. So I want to know that all my students get hired. Now, next, we have live classes three days per week. So the people that signed up on Saturday, Sunday, today, and tonight while I'm sleeping, guess what's going to happen for them? They're going to start the, the new class on Tuesday. And on Tuesday, we'll have an architecture discussion. And guess what? On Thursday, we'll have an architecture discussion. And on Friday, we'll have an executive business discussion, right? So there's that. So kind of keep this in your mind. We've got three live classes per week, and each class dines alone. And they're all standing alone. So we'll go through healthcare architectures, banking architectures, social media company architectures, video architectures, you name it. We're going to be doing a lot of architectures because that's the job. We'll get together. We'll design it together as a class. You'll present it back to me. You'll sell it back to me just like the real job. And then there's the lab component, which again is self-paced. 
So you'll be able to do your labs into your heart. Why do we love this? I had a student that had to go to India for two months to take care of family. They did. They came back. They were still able to get hired. I had a student that had to go to Ethiopia for a couple months. I had a student that had to go to Cameroon for a couple months. And by not using batches, I can keep you in until you're hired or give you up to a year in our program. I want every one of my students getting hired. I don't care about some silly certificate in the end. Your certificate is. I'm working as a cloud architect. That's our certificate. So we don't have batches. You come in and you stay with us until you're hired or up to a year passes because I need to know you get hired. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't about getting hired. Great, great, great question, Dr. Point. VP, it makes more sense to learn hand-on cloud engineering and become a cloud architect. That's the worst thing you could possibly ever do. That does creates a completely incompetent cloud architect. Not a competent one, a completely incompetent. And here's the reason. The cloud engineer is focusing on coding and configuring. And the architect is focusing on digital transformation. So VP, I'm going to ask you this. If you would like to be an airplane pilot, do you think it would be helpful for you to become a nurse and learn somebody else's job? Of course not. If you want to be a cloud architect, train to be a cloud architect. If you want to be, want to be a cloud engineer, train to be a cloud engineer. We'll create a very competent cloud engineer by doing cloud engineering which is a completely incompetent cloud architect because it's a different job. So you have to make a decision. Do I want to be an architect or do I want to be an engineer? Do you think learning how to fly the airplane is going to make you a better airplane pilot? Do you think being a nurse is going to teach you how to practice medicine? Of course it won't. It's a different job. So VP, I'm going to tell you the worst thing you could do to be an architect is to study engineering. You study architecture. So I don't know why, but for some reason, people don't seem to get what these architect jobs are. So I'll tell you, building architects, network architects, enterprise architects, and cloud architects do the same job. So VP, you want a hotel design, right? You hire an architect. You tell them I want it 50 stories tall. I would like a kilometer long water slide. I would like a golf course. I would like three pools and a jacuzzi and a helipad. The architect designs the blueprints. Now, VP, the architect does not use a hammer. They don't use a screwdriver. They don't use a saw. They don't do construction. They hire a construction crew. A cloud engineer is a construction crew. They build the stuff the architect designed. Do you think the guy that's going to design the Burj Al Arab, it would help him if he was good with a screwdriver? Of course not. It's somebody else's job. So the biggest problem I've ever seen people is they train to be an engineer. And they want to be an architect and nobody's going to hire you because you've got an engineering background. So VP, if you want to do it this way, what you're going to have to do is be an engineer and then forget all the engineering things you've learned. And because it's not what we do as an architect, so you're going to have to forget it all. And then you're going to have to retrain completely to be an architect. So you've got a choice. Train for the job you want in the first place. Train for everybody, somebody else's job. Waste a decade of your life. Unlearn all the things you learned in that decade and then convince a hiring manager you're not an engineer. If you think that's a good idea, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. And that's the problem. Don't study somebody else's job to get yours. Just don't do it. Because here's what happens. So now you're focusing on being an engineer, which is you're focusing on the tech. Great. Now you're a tech expert. And now you go to a, be an architect and you got to focus on business. Right. I love all of this tech. Great. That's not part of your job anymore. Business is. So no. If you want to kill your career, become an engineer on the way to be an architect. If you want to be an architect, focus on it. I mean, and that's really the key that matters most. And I'm going to tell you this, VP. I got further in my career in six months than most people do in 20 years because they're so busy learning everybody else's job. I don't understand this. I can't imagine why. Whenever I talk to a business, they're like, Mike, please make sure that you never send me an engineer for an architect job. And then managers are like, Mike, don't send me your architects for engineers because they're going to be lightweight. And that's the key. You've got to focus on the job, which is digital transformation. VP, I'm going to make this abundantly clear to you. Go outside tonight. Seriously, go outside tonight. When it's dark, Look at the sky, look at the moon, the stars, the clouds. That's 
that, that's what the architect focused on. All of that. Now, instead, I want you to now be an engineer. So I want you to take out a telescope and zoom in at 200% on the moon. And what are you going to see? The colors of the moon, the craters of the moon. Maybe you'll find that there's moon people that are made out of cheese. I don't know. Or you'll see a spaceship that got left there. That's what you're going to see at 200x. But what won't you see? The sky. You won't see the stars. You're gonna, you won't even see the whole moon. You'll see part of the moon. So for an architect, you've got to focus on the big picture. For the engineer, guess what you have to do? Focus on the tech. So no, the worst thing you can do to become an architect is to study engineering first. Study architecture if you want to be an architect. Study engineer if you want to be an engineering. Study programming if you want to be a programmer. Study house cleaning if you want to be a house cleaner. Study how to be a chef if you want to be a chef, but don't study to be a cloud architect when you really want a cooking career or chef career. I will tell you, VP, in the last 25 years, in the last 20 years of career optimization, 90% of the people that I met that struggled with their architect jobs, people that earn one to $200,000 less than the higher paid architects, all focused on being engineers. So you got your choice. Do you want to be a high paid architect or do you want to be an engineer? Both great careers. You can do either one that you like. They're both great, but you got to choose one. You can't fly an airplane and keep the passengers in their seat at the same time. I can't be practicing medicine in my office and administering the, pay, the medications that the nurses are doing at the hospital. Because all that'll do is create a competent engineer and a completely incompetent cloud architect. But I'm glad you asked the question. Bring in the next question, please. And you have dreadlocks with braided hair back. Will it be difficult? Well, Style Plus, I think you've got two choices. One is, it's fine if you have dreadlocks. Lots of people have dreadlocks. So be it. There's a lot of people on this planet that have dreadlocks. So that's fine. Hair braided back, again, totally fine. Now, can you speak well? Can you present well? Can you lead an audience? Can you design a technology solution? Do you have the emotional intelligence? Do you have the executive presence? Are you wearing the right kind of clothes? That's what matters. It doesn't matter if you have no hair, dreadlocks, red hair. It matters, are you there? And are you able to do it? Now, if you had tattoos all around your face and eyes and the tears that gang people do after killing people, some companies would still hire you, but some companies would say, wait, but dreadlocks or hairstyle, no, as long as it's clean. As long as it's clean. You can have clean dreadlocks. You can have hair braided back in a clean manner. That's great. That's who we are. That's our own individuality. That's never a problem. But are you hunched forward? That's not good. Are you sitting straight up? That's good. When you speak, do you have executive presence? Or you know, today is a Wednesday without executive presence. That'll hold you back. When you speak, are you speaking in proper grammar, complete sentences? Yeah, that'll hold you back. That'll get you there. If you're not, that'll hold you back. So look at the main issues, not your hair, not your nose, not your mouth. I mean, focus on the big picture. And I say this because, you know, I've got a buddy of mine that's worried about his nose. I'm like, don't worry about your nose. I was a martial artist for 20 years. My nose has been broken 20 times. It's just part of life. You know, I got a big nose. So there's that. But I want to be me. So no, it will not make it hard. Now, if your communication skills are not up to par, it'll be impossible. If your executive skills aren't up to par, it'll be impossible. If your communication skills aren't up to par, impossible, it'll be impossible. But if you got the right combination of the technical skills and the business skills and a great attitude, energy, and enthusiasm, well, you'll be hired in a heartbeat. So don't worry about that. You should be great. Focus on being great at your job. Focus on your job and not somebody else's job because I can't hire you for your job if you train for somebody else's job. You won't be hireable for that. You'll be great. You'll have no problem. Don't worry about dreadlocks. Actually, you mentioned dreadlocks. It reminded me of this reggae song I was listening to where this guy gets stopped by a police officer and he says, no, officer, me no like ganja man. Me only smoke cigarettes from the island. And he's talking about his dreadlocks. And I was just listening to that about an hour ago, practicing yoga, so it was super, super fun. I'm trying to think. It was a Kali Rhodes that wrote the song, but that's neither here nor there. But in any case, um, be yourself. Respect your individuality, be great at your career, and build an amazing career. Love that style plus. Have your own style. Okay. 
Okay, I can do one more question. Does your company help in landing a job or are you on your own? Well, it's a bit of a combination of both. Pradeep, I don't need to get anybody a job. My students are literally bombarded by recruiters. Robert Welch is on here. Um, he literally gets 10 to 20 interview requests per day. So Pradeep, getting the recruiters and the hiring managers to reach out to you every single day is uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind. If you're a real architect, all you'll do is design, present, and sell. There are engineers with architect titles, but they won't be doing that. So yes, we'll help you because the world's going to come to you. Now, also, occasionally, I also do reach out to other people. For example, one of my students went on an interview, and they wanted to hire him, but he turned it down. So he went to another company, and the company interviewed was, spoke to me and Chris the other day and said, I need a bunch of people from your program. Hiring manager from AWS also reached out to me and said, I need a bunch of people from your program. Recruiters reach out to me every day and say, Mike, do you have anybody that's ready? So for that, that's what we do. We teach them. And when people ask me, sure, I do place phone calls on people's things. But the point is, you don't need it. The world's going to come after you with the right resume. It'll be hard. My students say their biggest challenge is telling the recruiters and the hiring managers they're not ready for an interview yet. And they ask me every day, how do I maintain the relationship and not interview for two to three months? You won't have a problem getting a job if you're trained right, ever. So there's that. Um, I will get to one question um, for regarding for networking. If you're new to networking, we're going to teach you. We're going to teach you. I wasn't born knowing how to practice medicine. I didn't know. We teach networking, all networking. AWS networking is, is too junior to count as anything, but we still teach that. We go above the CCNA in class because it's not enough. And we teach the AWS training too. But that, I mean, seriously, we, that, what you're describing doesn't even scratch the surface of what we're teaching. We have 500 hours in our training program. We will teach all the networking, all the data center technologies, the appropriate applications, the business acumen, the leadership skills, the sales skills, the executive presence, the emotional intelligence, how to present yourself, how to write it up, CXO relevant, even how to negotiate a higher salary and how to interview. We teach all of it. All of it. All of it. There's nothing you're going to be learning on your own. That's why we created this course. It is a one-stop shop for everything you need to get hired. But we go way above AWS networking because that's just too junior for anything. Okay. Style Plus, there are people that have architect titles that aren't real architects that do code. That's called an engineer. Sometimes they're called the technical architect, but they're really an engineer. Architects don't touch the technology. So it might be true for this individual. And what also could have occurred Style Plus is you got someone that applied for a cloud architect job. And they good, had good cloud engineering skills, but they were a horrible architect. So what happens is they get what's called put out the pasture. And you put them in a role where they don't do architect work at all. And you make them do engineering because you can't send them out to be an architect. So I do know some architects that failed as an architect that get to do engineering things because they're real bad at what they do. So. They get stuck doing engineering things. But as a rule, we have hundreds and hundreds of people that we spoke. And, you know, I ask them every day, do you code? I have yet to speak to one working architect at AWS, Google, Azure, Deloitte, Bearing Point, Microsoft, Cisco, Capgemini, JP Morgan Chase, and I could probably go through a few of other big employers that have hired our people, and none of them ever code. The only people that do that are engineers with architect titles, and they're doing architect work and engineering work. And here's the thing, Style Plus. They get engineering pay and not architect pay either when they do these jobs. Not a real architect. STP, 
Our classes for the architect programs are done during weekdays. Architects are, mo are we, the, the funny thing for the architect is you have to train to be technical, but the job is 100% non-technical. Of the last uh, 150 or so architects that I've gotten hired, not a single one has touched the technology ever. Uh, it's a big joke, because what do you do? I go to meetings, Mike. What do you do, Mike? I entertain clients. What do you do, Mike? I buy a lot of dinners and drinks. What do you do, Mike? I take the people golfing. What do you do, Mike? I take this person to this evening establishment to try and get them to... So, so, so I haven't seen any architects in 25 years that did, except for the engineers. I have people from telecom. I have people from Cisco. I have people from networking. I have people from telecom. I have people from law. I have people from medicine. I have uh, people for this. And STC, how do you stay te technical without touching the tech? I'm going to make this really, really clear. We are about how to design the tech. Designing the tech doesn't have to do with anything. So if you were going to design a house and build the house, do you think you'd have to be using a hammer? Or do you think you'd have to be good at designing things? So we don't touch the tech, and touching the tech does not teach us design, ever. LM, you just wanted to say, I celebrated your weekend by upgrading to the live classes. Excited to start this year with live classes. LM, we are super excited to work with you. Super excited to work with you. And LM, I don't remember if you're in uh, Mozambique, because there's an LM we work with in Mozambique, and there's another one. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Mike, uh, before you wrap it up, I want to read a message that Arun shared Okay. over, over the weekend. Sure. He says, uh, Chris, uh, you probably should post this. <laughs> I'm attending meetings with, and I'm, I'm attending meetings with CTO, VP, directors, and I don't have time to configure stuff. I only have time to prepare well architected designs and presentations. Did I say I don't have time to do engineering? Yes, but I have time to party tonight with the strategic client for dinner. <laughs> and that's uh, Arun was probably the most uh, technically competent and brilliant uh, person that we had. He knew the tech inside and out, but he doesn't even touch it now. Yeah, because he's an architect. Right. Yeah. Uh, and here's the thing for those of you guys that want to do engineering. Arun went on like 50 interviews. He had all these silly certifications on his resume, and his resume was coded this in Java, coded this in Python, coded, coded, coded. And Chris, you, you remember, he went on interview after interview when he complained, Mike, I can't get hired. Were you in that class where I said, Arun, can we fix your resume and take off 90% of the tech stuff and replace it with business stuff? Yeah, it was pretty harsh. Yeah. <laughs> I took a dedicated an entire two-hour class to removing most of the tech stuff on Arun's resume. And Arun's like, Mike, I, I want to do this. I went to IIT. I'm super, I, I, like, I, I got to do that. Like, I said, Arun, do you want to get hired or do you want to have tech on your resume? And he says, Mike, I'll do anything to get hired. Yeah, so I removed was... the DevOps certifications, the SysOps certifications, any DevOps mentioned, any coding mentioned. He had three offers within a few weeks. And we're not talking about basic offers. We're talking about huge offers. Yeah. So it's he, good that you reminded that. He was the, he was the first uh, he was the first per, first live class uh, example of us fixing a, a LinkedIn and resume. His his was that was the first time we did it live in a class. It was a rooms. Yeah, so that was the first resume we did because I had no choice because I had an architect that wanted to yeah. present himself as an engineer, 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 engineer. So I literally took everybody off of architecture that day and said, this is what your resume needs to look like. Now, ever since we've done that, my students get bombarded. They can't even keep up with the interview requests. So I think we'll end on that, although somebody's saying, uh, STC, can you, can you ask one more question? Although I think we answered it. So his question was, without touching the tech, how do you stay technical? Well, pharmacologists study uh, drugs, uh, right? And they don't have to It was an STC that asked for one more question. It was someone else. Oh, who was it? Okay. Uh, Style Plus. No, Style Plus. What are your thoughts on digital transformation in the blockchain? Do you think there will be the next 10 years a high demand for architecture? 
So, you know, Style Plus, I've been working in architecture and blockchain now for about a decade. I don't know if it's going to make it. I think that, you know, we had mineable coins like Bitcoin and Ethereum used to be mineable. Those things that had worked behind them, I think there was something to them. I do think with regards to blockchain and shipping, I think we've got something. Um, making sure drugs are not diverted, there's something here. Style Plus, there are a tremendous number of things that we can do on blockchain or off blockchain. I'm not convinced that blockchain is here to stay. I think that most of these NFT projects are just going to die because there's no value in them. There's no work. It's just that value there's there. I don't know what's going to happen long term with regards to tracking equipment and things like that, which could be done on the blockchain. But you got to look at it this way. Blockchain is distributed computing. Cloud is centralized computing for the most part. So I wouldn't place any big bets in blockchain right now. I, I don't see it. I think some of this Web 3.0 stuff is going to just die out, and some of it will make it. So I think there's going to be selective blockchain projects, which are extremely good, but all in a row, just selective ones. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus my time, effort, or money in that right now. And I have a very strong blockchain background. I just don't, I'm not excited about it in today's world. So if you haven't hit the like button, please hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and hit the bell. If we helped you today, share the video link to someone other so we can help others as well. I'm going to remind you that we've got 35% off until midnight tonight, and then it's gone, and it'll be gone for a very long time before we'd ever get back to a 35% off. So now's your chance to take advantage of it. On Thursday, we have our How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar, and that'll be a great experience. And... Uh, Feel free to sign up for the free release of our Google Professional Cloud Architect book, and that will be released in the next month or so, somewhere in that time frame. Not exactly sure, because it's with the editors. And we want to deliver a beautiful product to you. So sign up, and you'll get it free. So give me a last hashtag cloud hired, everybody. Take advantage of our 35% off special while it lasts, which is going to end today. Take care, everyone.